Welcome to Breaking Banks. This week, we actually managed to have all of our hosts in front of their microphone at the same time. As we leave summer behind, we're in the middle of conference season. So we're going to talk about what we're seeing out there, where we think things are going, and what leaders should do about it as we head into the fourth quarter in the thick of strategic planning season for 2023 and beyond. Well, Jason, maybe we'll start with you. You have been um, pretty active lately, last uh, few conferences. So talk about kind of what you're seeing and I um, mean, the travel yeah. jag I've been on where every time you try and get together with me, I'm like, uh, I'm going to be gone and beginning to quit. My wife's beginning to question if I yes. actually live in Minnesota. Yes. You know, I think don't, don't, don't. They're, they're both is pent up demand that people miss part of the in-person that you know needed to take place. And I would say, you know, my own view is I did not miss being a road warrior. I know Brett lives for that sort of thing. But the one thing that you can't orchestrate via Zoom, as much as I love the fast tempo that um, being all digital can empower, you miss serendipity, right? And so the number of things that you know you encounter where the person you're standing in line with at the buffet line, or when you finish a talk and someone comes up and an hour and a half later, you're like, how have we never met before? And I'm curious, you know, Brett, is that true globally? Because I leave for Spain next week, but you know, I've just been on a domestic tear. No, no, absolutely. Um, I think um, you know, th there's that great experience that you get when you go to these events, and um, you know, someone comes up and they're like, they they're like your best friend, and you like, I don't know this person, and then suddenly they tell you their Twitter handle, and it's like, oh, now I know who you are. Um, but yeah, definitely, um, definitely it's nice to be back circulating and, and there's a social element, the, the tribal element to, to uh, fintech, which you can only really get at events, I think. Speaking of the tribal element, I've been on the road, um, but in a very different way, I think, than everyone else. Um, so I've missed out, unfortunately, on a lot of the great fintech conferences this season, the Move DevCon and the MX Summit. Um, we'll be starting to head back out to fintech events in October. But in the meantime, I've actually been on the literal road driving my 2010 Toyota Yaris all over the state of Oklahoma um, to meet different tribal leaders for Totem, um, which if you guys haven't been listening is our the digital banking app by and for indigenous people that I recently founded. Um, and it's been really interesting to do that because all of these different tribal nations are very different in terms of their culture and how they do things. And you really do have to meet face to face to make those relationships. And so I think it's just so important, you know, to remember the why we go out on the road and it's to get deals done. If you're not bringing home prospects, if you're not building relationships with folks that, um, you know, can support your business or help you grow your network in a meaningful way in that direction, um, what are you out there for? Um, just to collect conference swag, I don't think is a, a great reason. So, um, but, but it does. Well, in my case is to make speaking fee, Amber. But. Or make a speaking fee that that helps your business, though, right? That's helping your business. I think it's True. just really interesting to think about how we value these events and how we pick which ones we go to. Well, the other thing that got back face to face uh, this year, this summer was the banking schools. So I spent some time on the road myself in front of several hundred bankers at uh, three different schools this summer. And definitely felt the dichotomy of the bankers in their own world versus what's happening outside of that. And maybe let's start from the outside in. What are you seeing out there? And maybe let's start first with fintech and then um, go more broadly with the broader technology themes. What, what are the important trends that you think are actually live right now, as opposed to just still early in the hype cycle? Well, JP on his, I think at this point now, infamous Finnovate bingo card that he publishes every <laughs> Finnovate, he put digital account opening at the very center because that's in the PCBS and University of Wisconsin LSU class. We asked you know, everyone, like, what is your bank working on that's innovative? And they all answer digital account opening. Contrast that with if you really wanted to win at you know, Finnovate uh, bingo, this year was AI. In fact, like I was, you began to count. It was hilarious. Everything was AI 
And I love some of the riff that in the FinTech Fight Club, Mary and Lindsay, uh, Mary Winooski from Bankrate and Lindsay Davis from Atomic both went after is AI is not a solution to anything, right? It's a piece of technology and in and of itself demonstrating and saying, oh, we're AI solves no one's problem. Um, I think, um, you know, the, while while we see some maturation going on as a result of the adjustments in the market um, and so forth, fintech is still, um, you know, as of earlier this year, still demanding, well, you know, halfway through this year, still demanding one fifth of all VC deals. So um, there's no shortage of funding happening in fintech, although it's getting tougher, um, you know, but there are big deals uh, to uh, to be had, um, you know, Simon Taylor's uh, company just did a fifty million dollar round with Andreessen. What's the um, what's the name of that uh, company? Oh yeah, the Andreessen? Alloy Labs Alchemist Fund might have snuck into that one. We're oh, there you go. To, yeah. Um, but um, I, I think um, one thing that I'll I'll say, which I've been talking about for many years, you guys are probably sick of me talking about it, is the shift to mobile wallet away from classic card ecosystems. Um, you know, this is definitely in, in the developing world, um, a very clear trend now where more people have bank accounts on their phone than they do uh, with a traditional bank. Um, and, um, you know, you, 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 you wonder how long it's going to take for the MasterCard and Visa, you know, model to, to be compromised um, because of that writ large change in behaviour around, around mobile wallets. But um, that in itself, given the fact that more people are using a fintech in China every day these days than traditional banks, I think is in itself a really interesting inflection point in that it's clear now that fintech is just um, you know part of the embedded ecosystem. So, yeah, we were there in the early stages when uh, you know fintech was uh, whispered about in in uh, you know the halls of banks and so forth, and and now it's just become um, part of everyday life. Well, and it's interesting too, Brett, that you mentioned compromising the model. I think fintech is causing us to look at a lot of traditional infrastructure and and really pushing on those models and seeing where things can change. For example, you know, credit scoring, the traditional FICO credit score is under a lot of pressure right now um, with more and more people using the Vantage score, more and more people wanting to figure out how, how we can start reporting utility and, and phone and telecom payments um, to help people create a credit score that haven't had one before um, or raise one. I think identity is another area where just the proliferation of all of these different fintech apps and open banking are really pushing us to, to, to need to press for better solutions for identity and data control. And so, yeah, I think, I think a lot of the traditional infrastructure is just continually being pushed on and that's a trend that isn't going anywhere. Well, and you know, I think the downturn is actually a good thing for infrastructure that, and I think this is true across industries, and Brett, you talk about this some on The Futurist, that when everything is going up and to the right and it's growth at all costs, you see, let's just burn money to go acquire customers as a neobank. And let's go, you know, we can go fund 20 different neobanks and, you know, we need a neobank for left-handers who, you know, are right foot dominant, right? That aren't solving real problems, right? And they do these things because there was just too much capital on the side. And so I'd say this is true of like, if Bitcoin hadn't gone to the moon and everyone was looking at it, we would have seen better applications of blockchain than, you know, hey, let's build and hold value for Bitcoin and ETH. And I would say there's some really interesting applications of NFTs, except, hey, everyone jumping in and Web3 always goes up and to the right. You know, we, we didn't go solve some of the hard problems. Now, that's one of the things that excited us about Sardine is they are solving a really hard problem as it relates to fraud, right? And so the same is true of some of these payment systems that need to be reinvented in wallets. So I'd say it's a macro trend within the venture world. It's going to be really interesting to see what happens with some of these massively overvalued companies that have way too much money left and are probably burning too much too. While those things can be positives for 
um, challengers, I think they can often work the opposite way to incumbents, right? When you've got a tougher economy and people are looking at technology to just kind of hunker down and create cost savings. There was an article in American Banker a few weeks ago that said, our bank's technology bets finally paying off. And the conclusion from the analysts and consultants that were quoted was mostly yes, but the reasons they cited were all about expense savings and efficiency gains. That's the opposite of what you all just talked about, which is finding new ways to solve real problems for new sets of customers and markets. And so I, I do worry that um, it, it, there, there's weird dichotomy right now in that um, incumbent financial institutions and insurgent startups are kind of going in different directions. And yet at the same time, um, there's never been more collaboration through things like embedded finance and banking as a service, which I want to come back and make sure we talk about specifically. But what, what do you think for the traditional financial services? Even that headline's a problem for me, you know, because it, 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 you can tell right there that the industry still doesn't fundamentally get it. Um, you know, if you look at, the, um, you know, there's a lot of debate going on right now about challenger profitability and which challenges will survive and so forth. Um, but if you look at WeBank and NewBank, who are arguably the two most successful challengers um, globally, they have both cracked the problem of financial inclusion at very low acquisition cost. And that's something that the traditional banking industry will never do and has no interest in doing, frankly, right? Um, so there are, you know, some, some really interesting st structural changes there once you look at technology in the right way in terms of accessibility to finance, to Amber's point, to accessibility to credit and so forth that just isn't solvable with the current system. I mean, you know, you can we can talk all we want about improving FICO scores and things like that, but the reality is that that system is designed mostly to punish people who default on credit. It's not actually a tool designed to improve financial access. Um, and with all the criticism we level at China for their, for Sesame Credit and the social scoring system, you know, the FICO and experience scores are exactly that. They, they do, they carry the exact same function in the US uh, system at least. So, um, you know, that's where we need to make the big strides and leaps, not, um, you know, um, reducing reliance on our core system or having um, better uptime on our website or, you know, these hygiene factor things that seem to be the way the industry talks about tech um, versus, you know, the way technology can really solve the problems. I don't know where silent. we go from there. <laughs> Mic drop. Yeah. All right. This well, I think one episode, right. Brent, I, I think there's a twofold question here. One Amber hit it on already, which is the systems built on aging infrastructure just can't afford and have no incentive yeah. to go do this. And I'd say the second piece, and this is the which harder is why one, the greenfield stuff you see coming out of other economies tends to not have that problem, you're right. Tends to not have that problem. And we suffer from a good enough characteristic, right? ACH and now, you know, with RTP, which is not as phenomenal, you know, game changing, because, you know, no customer's ever woken up and said, ooh, I really need RTP. And it's never heard of the clearinghouse, except they confuse it with the sweepstakes. Um, <laughs> and I would say the second problem, though, is one of strategy and business model that the incumbents, and I would say actually most of the fintechs in the US suffer from the same problem is they just tried to digitize this, what used to be a beautiful business model called I take deposits in from largely consumers on one side that I don't have to pay for. And I lend it out you know, largely to you know, businesses, small business and you know, corporate real estate, et cetera. And I just sit on this arbitrage of you know, what I paid for the deposits and what I you know, get back on the loans. And if you look at the innovation, air quotes around innovation for most of the um, challengers coming in, both on the lending side is, ooh, can we look at a new way of doing underwriting, which is not well tested. And I think many are now exposed to a lot more risk than they think, 
or can I build a business that lives on interchange and, you know, is a challenger bank? And I think this is why we're seeing such a massive rebundling is disaggregating the other business model doesn't work. And no one bothered to go think through how do I actually just reinvent the business model? All right. So, so where are all these trends heading over the next, say, three to five years or, or beyond? I mean, what's this look like both for incumbents and for the challengers? Why don't we ask our challenger first, Amber? I think we Global all qualify. domination. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think in terms of where this is headed over the next three to five years, I, to be candid, I think we'll see a lot of bodies hit the floor in the challenger space. Um, those models are are under a lot of pressure and acquisition is, is very tough in a, in a very full playing field. Um, and so I, I think that we'll learn some lessons over the next three to five years. I think that there will also be a lot of opportunity for the folks that are trying to go about this a little bit differently to not just, not just play with the model, but also to, to kind of tinker with partnerships with banks in a way that is a little bit different than just being the the bin sponsor on the back end of a challenger. Um, I know that we're exploring a lot of really interesting partnership opportunities uh, under like a, a CRA, Community Reinvestment Act, um, heading. And so we're seeing a lot of inbound interest from folks in what we're doing. And I think that that's because banks are seeing, okay, they've got this empathy and customer focused thing down. Let's, let's talk to them and see what they're doing. Not that anyone's coming at it with solid ideas for how to, how to do that. But I do think we'll be exploring a lot more interesting machinations in the, in the coming years. Yeah, I, I mean, the one thing I'm seeing um, is more conversation, not about profitability. Uh, you know, I think when when you hear bankers talk about when are these challenger banks going to be profitable, they're hoping that challengers go under because they're not profitable. And, and you know, there, there's not, I, I don't think that's the mechanism that the, the, the investors are looking at to determine whether or not they continue to invest. Certainly we have more emphasis on lifetime value now than we had uh, you know, during the pandemic, which was, uh, you know, as per Jason's comment, just growth at all costs. Um, and you know, you've got some significant developments there. You, know, you look in the UK market today, you know, almost 40% of all salaries are direct deposited into challenger banks in the UK. Um, you know, keep in mind that none of these banks really existed until 2014. New Bank, which is it has at you know various times in the last 12 months um, been the largest bank by market cap in Latin America didn't exist nine years ago. Um, you know, WeBank that has a quarter of a billion customers in China, you know, started in, you know, took their first account, opened their first account in 2015. The the rate of progress we've seen from challenges. Um, I think is indicative of the fact that there was a massive opportunity in the market that technology helped us fill. And I don't think that's going to go away from some pressure on challenges, but I agree with Amber. I think some of the challenges aren't going to make it. I think in, in many ways, this is similar to the maturation process we saw at the end of the dot-com, you know, with companies having to have real businesses with real revenue. Having said that, I, I you know, Amazon wasn't profitable for the first 20, year, 20 years of its existence. And I don't think challenges need to rush into profitability to survive. They just need to demonstrate um, the, they, their continued low cost of acquisition and improved engagement metrics that is going to lead towards lifetime value for them to continue to close the fin finding, financing deals. Well, I think for the traditional incumbents, we're going to continue to see consolidation. You know, JP Morgan Chase now has 10% uh, market share and Jamie Dimon says he doesn't think 20% is out of the question. Um, that's actually unheard of in this super fragmented business of, of banking, right? I've said many, many times we've had over 13,000 financial institutions. When I entered the industry, we're less than 5,000 today. Um, Mike Mayo, bank analyst, looked at just J.P. Morgan Chase and Bank of America and said that their total deposit increase over the past two years, the amount of just the increase alone was 
equivalent to a number six U.S. bank. So the big will continue to get big, right? Scale is starting to matter. Um, as you've talked about many times, Brett, bringing customer acquisition costs down, right? Scale can help um, with that. But Jason, as you and I both have talked many times too, this um, consolidation round is probably not good news. Uh, you know, in the past, when you say, oh, there's going to be a lot of consolidations, bank CEOs say, oh, that's great. I'm going to get cashed out. And I was looking towards retirement anyway. And, you know, bank valuations uh, are seriously did yeah <laughs> no no the, on the on the retirement thing you know because i present at boards all around the world at banks and you know the most common reaction i get because you guys know i'm talking about digital disruption i talk about all these trends Wait, can, you know, I can talk I about guess? what it's going to be like i was going to say the, i have a guess too all right, all right. <laughs> amber, amber, you go guess, ahead amber you guess first what what, what do you i won't think? have what do you to think? I won't have to worry about that. I'll be retired by then. That I don't have to worry guess. about that. I'm I'll be so, off the board by then. <laughs> I'm well, so see, none of us were guessing. I'm retiring. We, we've we've all so, seen we've this all heard it. before. Yeah. <laughs> It's true. It's true. But um, I think that's indicative of the fact that when you when you talk about um, techno technological change writ large in the industry, um, the reason the technological advances we see, it, it, um, you know, in, in fintechs and so forth tends to be faster is you've got a new generation of thinking. You don't, it's not just a legacy systems architecture, it's a legacy thinking that you have to, to get past, you know? Right. I like my, to... Go ahead. Go ahead, Jess. No, I was, I was just going to call say, it the competitive about... advantage of desperation, right? No, Which no, my, is... my, my joke on this is, you know, um, you don't, um, you know, bankers don't immediately retire when they finish their career, you know, um, they, they then go to go on to become regulators, you know, and do more damage before they die. You know, so. I wish that Sorry. was not a joke. Uh, well, yeah. well, we're certainly well, in an era different. of, we're certainly in an era of re-regulation, right? That it, it, this is not uh, the long trend of deregulation from the early eighties up until certainly the, um, uh, financial crisis. And I, I, I think we had a brief respite from it, but we're in the part where the regulators are looking at really all spaces of that. Amber, how are you feeling now that you've stepped out of, like you've gone progressively from the, you know, your role at bank director in terms of bringing bank and fintechs together and could do uh you know commentary to alloy labs right where now you're actually trying to not just bring banks and fintechs into contact with each other but get them to like do meaningful deals and innovate to now you are the innovator that is actually toe-to-toe -to -toe with a bank stepping into the regulatory trenches how do you feel about regulation at the moment and what needs to change? What can I say here that will not come back to haunt me? <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> um, no, I, th I think that, you know, in terms of regulation, I think the regulators are just kind of realizing that they have a lot to catch up on um, in a very short amount of time. And so I think a lot of the activity, the flurry of activity that we're seeing now um, is kind of a, a very kind of human response to that feeling of, oh shit, how, what, what got away from us? Um, I think. No, no, finish the thought. <laughs> okay. Sorry. <laughs> I think a lot of it is, um, this moment of like, oh shit, what got away from us? Um, but I also think that in terms of the government more broadly, we're seeing a lot of really positive interest in fintech banking, the financial system as a whole. Um, we actually received proactive outreach from the Bureau of Trust Funds Administration, um, wanting to know what we were doing at Totem, how that was working, uh, you know, how we were digitizing payments. Um, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of knee-jerk reaction to to get on top of this and to understand what's going on, but I think ultimately that'll be a net benefit for the industry. Agree. Um, no, I, I was going to say um, on the the regulatory piece. Um, obviously, we have a technology gap in in some some respects, and um, you know if you if you look at um, the Community Reinvestment Act in the United States. 
and you look at anti-money laundering globally, these are two very good examples of where legislation really trails some of the advancements we're making in the space right now. Um, you know, uh, on, on the CRA side, we know that from a financial inclusion perspective, we know mobile phones work far better than branches. So why is it that banks are still held to this CRA um, requirement in terms of branching? And the CRA is constantly being used as an excuse for why the US hasn't done a fintech charter because it would not be a level playing field for banks that um, you know, have to uh, uh, you know, comply with the CRA. So you know, that, that's, first of all, that's ridiculous. CRA should just be gone and, you know, financial inclusion should be, be rethought. But on the AML side, I met with FinCEN a few years ago. And as you guys know, um, Joanne Barefoot and I worked on a, uh, a you know, a, a treaties, if you like, on where regulation would have to evolve in Bank 4. And, you know, as part of that, um, we had the discussion with FinCEN about the fact that um, for regulation, for us to be successful at stopping money laundering, and keep in mind that globally today we stop about one percent of of money laundering globally. So you know, despite spending you know hundreds of billions of dollars annually on it, we're woefully ineffective. It's it's one of the most ineffective um, you know pieces of compliance and regulation we have globally. To solve that, we need global data sharing agreements, and we need to treat 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 money laundering like cybersecurity as a network effect issue and cut off bad actors at the source once we identify their behavior. This requires broad data sharing. It requires large investments in things like artificial intelligence um, instead of suspicious transaction reporting on, you know, using a highlighter on a, an, you know, on, on printed paper and, and all that sort of BS. Um, and yet, um, and, and FinCEN was like, we know this is the way it's going to have to go at some point in the future. We just can't think of a way to get there. So, yeah. Brent, and believe it or not, LA Labs being a consortium of, you know, we are well into the top 20 now. That's that's the third time you've mentioned LA Labs. I know, but I'm allowed. But for any of the uh, listeners that are going to be at Money 2020 and are interested in the consortium model when it comes to fighting fraud with our friends at Sardine, uh, we are actually tackling this because waiting for regulatory bodies to solve it, you know, isn't moving fast enough. So it is now, you know, up to industry to pick up the baton and carry that forward. So if you're going to be at Money 2020 and want, are interested in solving that problem, DM me. I'm just going to bring us uh, to a little bit more uh, near-term focus. So given all of what we're seeing out there uh, around the world, what should leaders be focused on for the next 12 to 18 months? And obviously that depends on what kind of organization you're leading. So let's try to be a little bit diverse about that. Maybe the cannabis business. <laughs> well, know. <laughs> you know, there was a um, the, the annual survey from uh, bank director Amber's alma mater, and uh, that was pretty high on there. A lot of banks are trying to figure that out, uh, but at the same time, it was more of a, what we talked about too. That they the the thing that was most troubling to me: fifty four percent said that. Um, other community banks and credit unions were their number one competitor. Um, you know, really not focused enough on um, seriously. Yeah, I, I, I'm a challenger. Only um, uh, 29 percent said maybe they were already smoking it. <laughs> <laughs> Just 29 percent said digital payment providers such as Square and PayPal, and merely six percent identified digital non-bank consumer lenders as their toughest competition. All right. So what uh, should uh, leaders... Uh, I just, I, no, I want to jump in on that, JP. Okay. Um, have you guys seen um, uh, the reporting on the debate that happened at JP Morgan Chase internally regarding the end of credit cards? So this apparently, as reported in American Banker, split the bank big time. Right, because um, it, it is fairly evident right now that um, buy now, pay later, and that sort of contextualization of credit is obviously going to be a threat to to credit cards. Um, and 
Apple is when, when Apple gets in the game and Amazon gets in the game, you know that um, they are seeing this emerging behavior come out and it is they are trying to capture existing credit card business. But imagine being at a bank like Chase and, 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 and strategically suggesting that um, it's time to roll up the credit card product and go with embedded credit offerings. You know, can you imagine how how difficult a conversation that would be? It's about time we had the conversation. I think the part that it's easy to gloss over, Brett, is they're cannibalizing interchange, which you know I've been preaching the death of interchange for far interchange, too long. Interchange, in look, it's already dead. You know, it's already Africa, dead. You just don't it's dead know in it. China. Yeah, exactly. But everyone wants to hang on to it because it's such an important part of their financial picture, right? But we're seeing, and I think this is what Chase sees, is you have one of two choices. I either go upend the market, lead the way, and develop a new business model, or I wait until the market upends. And I think this ties back to JP's point, which is you can't cut your way to greatness. And so everyone who's focused on cutting their way to greatness, protecting interchange, protecting you know all the little pieces they can. Overdraft fees. Overdraft fees for too long when the market changes, it's too late. And you know, one of the favorite phrases that JP Amber and I heard in all of our travels with bankers is, we're more of a fast follower. Well, that only works, <laughs> as JP says, if you're fast, and they're not. And so think by the time it takes place and that you recognize it, it you're three to four years into the disruption being visible, not even the, the foundation being laid, but three to four years into the disruption, right? So now it hits mainstream, you go like, oh, oh, overdraft fees are going away. Well, that's been evident for a really long time. Why are you surprised by this? And you, you try and protect it. If you're not figuring out how to fix that now, the market wipes you out. You go the way of the dinosaur. Yeah. Uh, and I think there's a, a bunch of elements like that. Um, and it's just, I, you know, in most cases, it's just systemic inertia, right? You know, um, like if you look at check payments in the United States. Um, you know, like, you know, a few years ago, when I looked at the stats on this, two thirds of all the world's checks were written in the US. It's probably 75% now. Um, and, um, you know, you, you will still hear a full-throated defense of why the US needs checks. But it's like, well, none of the rest of the world really needs checks. So, um, you know, why, uh, why the big deal for us, you know, like why in the US can, have, can't we uh, move on? And then you then you come to, as you said, Jason, the issue of, well, nobody wants real-time payments. Yeah, well, okay, not when we talk about it as real-time payments, but if you want to be paid by someone and see the balance hit your account in real time, yeah, you'd be you'd be for that, right? You'd be, you know, as a consumer, you'd be all for that, right? Because you, you don't, that they, doesn't make sense to have your money sitting for three to five days in some mystery bank account somewhere before it eventually gets to you. Um, so, I, you know, when, when you look at um, why we haven't got rid of checks, it's just inertia and invested interest. It's not actually anything that's in, in the particular interests of consumers. And when we talk about AML, when we talk about credit scoring, like Amber was discussing um, earlier and so forth, the same could be said, CRA, the same could be said for all of these things. If we're really trying to reform the industry using technology to make it a better experience for customers, then unfortunately, we can't look to the industry for that. We have to look at the disruptors. And that's, I don't think, is going to change regardless of where the markets are. I found myself quoting more often uh, Ted Levitt's phrase from 1961. We talked about the railroad business. The problem is they thought they were in the railroad business instead of the transportation business. And this is all about bankers being in the banking business. So if you are a banker, let's start there. What should you be focused on over the next 12 to 18 months, given the things that we're talking about, Brett? Well, you know, <laughs> I know it's it's crazy, but getting rid of signatures. I'm not talking about digital account opening, right? I'm, I'm talking about um, uh, just um, 
you know, removing the friction that customers have in the day-to-day -day experience that exists with having to sign a piece of paper. You know, I mean, that, uh, you know, if you, if you want to compete in any sense with the pure plays, the fintechs who are in the space, you have to be able to onboard and acquire a customer digitally at scale. And that is, I think, the foundational difference between the fintechs and the incumbents right now. Yeah, that's necessary, but still insufficient, right? Merely, no, right. Absolutely. merely removing yeah. friction, right? If, <laughs> if you're not really... Um, able to solve problems beyond, you know, removing friction means, okay, I got the account open, but <laughs> what is the account? Right. What does it do? Um, who's it serve? And I think that that brings us to the second piece of it is, is, you know, what is the role of the bank moving forward? And I, and I think what the technology tools are bringing us is more understanding of behavior, um, you know, things like financial wellness, financial health, those, what you would have um, considered softer skills, um, you know, from a banking perspective uh, in the past. But I think the, the fundamentals that the wallet ecosystem is teaching us is that if people are more aware of how they're using their money and how to spend money, then they become more effective at managing their money. So if you look at what is the basic requirement that a bank account should provide its customers, it should be helping you manage your money more effectively. And where we've got the biggest gains to make in that respect, I think, is actually not necessarily in the retail side, but on the commercial side with SME bankings, For sure. removing that friction of accounting and taxation treatment and all that sort of stuff. It's we could automate behind. the crap out of that, man. You know, we could we could have your accounting system behind the login. You know, as soon as you do a transaction, it goes on the ledger. That is sort of really basic stuff to do right now, and would be um, it would save billions, hundreds of billions of dollars a year in uh, you know economic costs of processing you know banking information for small small to medium enterprises globally. For me, I think the things that bank leaders need to be thinking about are all about talent. We are yeah, certainly, certainly, you know, we're seeing more and more consolidation, but I, I'm of the opinion that we're actually in a post-consolidation banking for era, uh, era for banking, meaning that consolidation acquisitions are not the way that we grow anymore. And so we have to figure out what those new growth strategies are. If you're a $250 million bank that's hoping to get acquired by your local regional, the odds of that are getting lower and lower. And so, uh, you know, if you want to leave a legacy for your bank, um, you need to start thinking not just about acquiring talent, but really shifting the infrastructure and the culture of your bank so that it will be prepared to receive that talent in a way that actually moves things forward. So I, I was just with a bank a few weeks ago and they were talking about, uh, can you explain to the CEO why we need this role that translates between the developers and the business line? Because we can't get that approved and we really need this role, right? So like, we're still just in very early stages of even comprehending what a tech enabled tech focused banks looks like. And so I think that bank leaders really need to do their homework and figure out, um, you know, that this isn't just like tech stuff that you can put in a separate wing and, and let them do their innovation thing over here. We really have to rethink how you're structuring your, your bank internally and how you're incentivizing things, what, what you're rewarding um, to, to really start to move the needle. And because we've seen so many fintechs trying to get leaner and, and doing a lot of layoffs, there's a lot of tech talent out there to be had, but you have to have a good environment for them to come into and know that they're going to be supported. Well, I completely agree with that. And I would add to it, it's not just the tech talent because the, the connective tissue is really the strategy and purpose. And it goes back to what I just said a few minutes ago. If we just think our strategy and purpose is to be a bank, to gather deposits, mark them up and make loans, um, well, then, you know, we've got 5,000 others that are doing that. But if you can really connect around, hey, there, there's a mission for us to serve for a set of customers that is not just trying to be all things to all people. And our leaders have to really embrace that and not be afraid uh, to double down on some places and to cut out of some other places. Because if we don't do that, then the technology, as you said, it can just sit in another wing somewhere. 
And I'm, I'm kind of tired of conversations with uh, CEOs and COOs who, as soon as it sounds anything like technology, immediately says, oh, that's not me. I need to get the CIO or CTO uh, in here to have that conversation because the technology it's, is it's just a tool. Well, and it's now your responsibility to understand at least the base level need that your organization has for that. You don't have to write the code, but you have to understand what the tool can do and while uh, how you might deploy it. Well, what about for challengers, Amber? As a a new uh, fintech founder, um, what do you and, and 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 I'm sure this will be colored by your own experience and your own priorities. But is there anything maybe a little bit more general for um, the challengers out there? What should they be focused on over the next twelve to eighteen months? Burn. <laughs> you should be focused on your burn rate. I think that's um, that's true for all of us. But in in seriousness, I think that. Fraud, particularly synthetic fraud, is something that is getting more and more sophisticated every day. It's not a nice to have, it's a must have now. Um, and so if you're not bringing in the appropriate folks to help you understand that, not only is it a systemic risk to your company, but it is also um, you know, a, a risk to the sector as a whole in terms of, of how regulators look on how we're managing these things. Yeah. Um... It, it, it's really just um, table stakes, right? You have to be able to prevent that because um, it's just not good for anybody if you can't manage the fraud piece. It's not a good customer experience. Uh, it doesn't help your burn rate. Um, and it, it's it's not uh, good for some serious potential financial loss. All right, Brett, I'll give you the last word here. Any um, advice for challengers uh, over the next 12 to 18 months? What should they focus on? Uh, yeah, I think, um, you know, I, I know it sort of is cliche, but I think um, access to behavioral credit, uh, I think, is going to be an area where the challenges continue to really differentiate. Um, and I think um, it's table stakes for fintechs, you know, I think, um, you know, particularly for challenges, but um, the ability to deepen the, uh, um, uh, the wallet. Um, relationship with customers requires credit, but not in the conventional sense. I don't think selling mortgages or, um, you know, uh, credit cards is the way to go. I think, um, you know, tr experimenting on the model of buy now, pay later, or, or those types of um, alternatives to credit cards or overdraft type experiences, but embedded contextually based on behavior, it solves a lot of those problems we've been talking about today it gives you it gives you that approach to differentiated uh, you know differentiation from from an overdraft or those types of uh, you know traditional traditionally credit scored experiences as well as putting you r removing um, the competition of trying to think about which credit card you're going to use in a store by you know put, putting a trigger either location based or behaviorally based on the in the wallet or on the handset so um, and it solves a lifetime value problem and keeps you getting funded that's that's my view well and it also gets you to personalization so that you are really delivering something um, that that is in tune to customers needs and jobs to be done uh, beyond just, hey, we're a bank or we're a neobank or we're a fintech, or right? These very broad definitions. So I think that's about all the time we have for today. So I'll we'll wrap up our host roundtable. Glad to have everybody uh, back at a microphone, even if uh, you're, you're not at uh, home, Brett. And um, so we'll, we'll have more right after this. That's it for this week. If you like the show, make sure to give us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform or share it with a friend, or share it on social media. We'll see you again next week with more Breaking Banks.